Al Summerall. And all these preached to me this past 50 years. Praise God. We thank the Lord for each one of these wonderful pastors. And I always like to use my pastor, uh, whoever is pastoring, uh, at the assembly time. So I'm sure this message will sink in our hearts and cause us to live better. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, we'll go right ahead with the program here. And we have a song arrangements by Verla, Verlin Thornton. Praise the Lord. We've asked several of the family members to join us again in a song this morning that talks about if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me, where would I be? Worship with us as we sing.
sing one more? If you're not, well, I want to introduce my family here. The rest of the family, come to the platform right quick here. And we'd like to stand, stand out there like he was. <laughs> I'll introduce them as a, a brother Thornton and uh, my daughter and, and granddaughter. And uh, where, where's Hugh Edwards? Yeah, Hugh Edwards is coming. And there comes Grandma with the two great grands. <laughs> All right, uh, there's my grandson and his wife, and there's Hugh Edwards and his wife, and then. Uh, uh, there's Victoria. Her husband was here, but he had to go back and start teaching. He had to leave us. But he left two little senoritas with us. <laughs> and we're glad to have these senoritas. And this, uh, of course, the main one in the bunch is uh, the blonde-headed that you see there in the middle. <laughs> I'm proud of all of our family. Glad that they're each one working in the church somewhere. And uh, it's, uh, if we could just get every family in the church of God all working together, we'd build a church of God, wouldn't we? Yeah. I'm proud of my family. And this is a young lady that stuck with me. How many years now? Almost 58. Be 58. 18th of this month. September. September. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to have my family here. They work together. Uh, uh, we're separated by miles, but uh, we're still working for God and His church. And I'm very happy about that. Today, I come before you as a servant of the Lord. I want you to know that uh, it has been a privilege and a pleasure to be a servant of the Lord for these many years. The Lord is so good to us. He helps us from day to day. He keeps us uh, in His will. And we want to continue to do His will as long as He lets us live. We know that time is getting short, and uh, uh, many of us
Thomas won't get to be here much longer, but we want to uh, do what we can while we're well and able. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, it's just so good to see all of you here. Oh, it uh, shows that you have a desire uh, to see the church of God rise and shine in this world. Praise God. So good to have all of you here. Oh, it's wonderful that you've come in here to do business for God and his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's God's church. And we're just servants. We're just servants of God. And we want to serve him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, hallelujah. Put everything we've got into it, and God will reward us, uh, not, not only in this life, but in the life to come. We want to be faithful uh, uh, to God uh, and do his work. Uh, oh, praise God. We don't know what uh, uh, has uh, 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 facing us in the future, but we know uh, who holds the future, and he's the one that we're looking to. Uh, he's the uh, Ahead of the church, I just want to be a servant that would please him. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that came to this world and gave his life and shed his precious blood that I might have salvation and eternal life. Praise God. Oh, this is wonderful to think about. Oh, I just thrilled you to start off uh, here today. Uh, and I thank the Lord for all uh, other wonderful messages uh, that have been preached here in this assembly. I thank the Holy Ghost uh, uh, for being here in our midst. Uh, oh, he's been all around us here. Oh, the Holy Ghost has been in our uh, midst. And we want to honor him. Uh, the uh, Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's in our midst. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. He's here to bless us today. Oh, praise God. Oh, it's just wonderful that everyone is uh, so thrilled. I know it's uh, been a hardship on a lot of people. It's been very expensive to come. Uh, but you love the church of God enough to come and give yourself uh, uh, to worship God here in this assembly. And we want to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Praise God. Now the time is slipping by. I've got a few things I'd like to say. And I hope you'll uh, bear with me for a few minutes. And uh, again, I want to thank the pastor for his wonderful message. I feel like he's been a blessing to me this year. He's kept us inspired. He's kept us uh, uh, with a victory. And all, all these pastors have been so wonderful through the years. But uh, today is different. We've got to uh, live this day. We want to live this day in a way it pleases the Lord. Now then, we hope to say something that would uh, encourage us and uh, try to help us to do more for God and his church. Praise God. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's Acts 27, 25. 276 men in a battleship, battered ship on the Mediterranean Sea were caught in a severe storm that had lasted for many days. Now they were in despair, having lost all hope that they would be saved. Paul was a prisoner on that ship en route to Rome, and in the midst of such trouble, he stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye shall have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer 
for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. To make this public declaration in the midst of uh, such fearful circumstances, one surely would have to be convinced of what he spoke. There was no uncertainty in the mind of this great apostle. <coughs> Excuse me. His assurance was based upon a divine visitation. An angel had brought him a message from God. They were not out of the storm, and some even worse trouble was on the way. But Paul's assurance of their ultimate survival was without question in his mind. Yes, the ship was going uh, to run aground, and he be broken in pieces, but there would be no loss of life. This Paul knows because he was in touch with God. Ever since this encounter with Jesus, Christ on the road to Damascus, he had known he could depend upon God's word. Lying there on the ground that day, trembling and astonished, he had asked, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. This first lesson was not an easy one for this strong-willed man, someone having to lead him by the hand and his being without sight for three days, during which time he neither ate nor drank, but he waited on God's promises. At the time of God's own choosing, he sent Ananias to Paul, Saul, to conform, uh, confirm his promises. It was a hard lesson, but an effective one. Saul learned that the voice of God could come and uh, to an individual, that a man could indeed uh, hear from heaven, and that God's promises were dependable. Later, toward the end of his ministry, we read of his testifying to the Ephesians elders, saying, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit under Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. There was no doubt in Paul's mind that he would be bound at Jerusalem, and so he was. He knew when God had spoken that it could be depended upon. Paul's life and ministry after he met Jesus was not one of routineness, when in a religious form. He found a vital relationship with God which provided him a foundation for unshakable faith. So in that storm-tossed ship, he knew that he would not perish in the sea, nor would any of the other 275 men. Such divine certainty is much in need today as we continue our journey upon troubled waters. We have an unfaltering faith However, it is essential that we possess a communion with God. Let's say communion with God. Communion with God. The same kind of personal relationship with him that Paul had. What we know, we must be assured by divine 
revelation. This surely must be the idea conveyed in Christ's statement to Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter's very positive declaration, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, was a bold one indeed. It was not a, a trite statement of common usage that he was merely parroting. He was stating a fact that had been revealed to him by God. He did not get it secondhand. The rock upon which Christ's church is being built does not allow for a secondhand faith. We must know that what we know by divine revelation, only then can we teach and preach with a conviction that is convincing. This kind of knowledge provides a, a certainty that cannot be had otherwise. To acquire such revelation demands a relationship with God that is fresh and alive. A form of religion is not enough. God is alive, and his church must be alive in him. People today are needing divine direction, and they have every right to ask the church of God, is there any word from the Lord? That's right now. <laughs> they need to ask the church of God, is there any word from the Lord? Praise God. We want to be able to give them the word, don't we? This is not a time for a stale leadership. Leaders in God's church must have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Paul was a positive leader because he was in touch with God. He knew what it meant to hear from heaven. To be out of touch with heaven invites a routineness in our program that does little to end ties people to a zealous pursuit of the church's work. <coughs> Indeed, to apathy and carelessness, and lead to apathy and carelessness. Spiritual leaders are needed now who can arouse and motivate people to move forward in preparation for the Lord's return. The inspirational quality for such leadership will be found in those who possess the certainty of divine revelation. Too many seem simply to be teaching what they have heard others teach and preaching that they have heard others preach. In need of, and instead of going to God for their messages, look out now, Such teaching and preaching lacks the conviction needed to stir listless people. It is surely time for the church to be the church, for it is to function with the power and authority given by her Lord. Jesus himself declared, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. The Son can do nothing of himself, but that he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, uh, these also doeth the Son likewise. It was this in immediate contact he had with his Father that enabled him to teach as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes lacked this spiritual contact and could teach only that which had been taught them by those who preceded them. They had no divine unction, no fresh anointing. We all want a fresh anointing, don't we? Let's say fresh anointing. If you don't remember anything else in this uh, uh, address, uh, just think of fresh anointing. <laughs> Let's say it again, fresh anointing. God is still speaking to us today through Jesus. Then through divine revelation, we are in tune with his voice. We can proclaim with the boldness what he is saying. 
then there will be no occasion for timely or weakness or timidity or weakness of faith. Rather, it will bring the positive assertion, for I believe God that it will be even as it was told me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, we want to be able to have a word uh, from the church of God, don't we? Praise God. We want to put it in operation. Stir this world. Hallelujah. Have that fresh anointing. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm enjoying it whether you are or not. <laughs> All right, here's one that says, dare to be different. Now, you know, it's hard for some of us to, want, uh, you know, try to be different. Uh, but we're different from the world, the way I think. We're supposed to be. And if we've got enough of God in us, we, we're bound to be different. <laughs> so... I'll try to say a few words here that uh, will encourage us to be different. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the potion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he required, requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now he requested that himself. He, uh, he didn't want to defile himself for what, even what the king had. He wanted to be different because he had something different. <laughs> it was a strange land into which Daniel and his friends had been brought. The religion and customs were different from that they had uh, been accustomed to in the land of Judah. Far from home, it, is, it might have been more uh, convenient for these young men to have blended in with their new surroundings. Their spiritual convictions, however, would not allow for compromise. Their faith in God gave them boldness to stand up for him in an alien land. They dared to be different. Let's say, dare to be different. Not only was Daniel's courage demonstrated in refusing the king's meat, it was further manifested when the royal decree was issued that no one pray or ask a petition of any god or man except of the king for 30 days. To do so was to be punished by death in a den of lions. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks. The more the people yielded to God, the more God's glory came down and they found themselves in the atmosphere of a self-perpetuating revival whose momentum was sustained as the Spirit had its way. Lives were touched deeply. Spiritual stirring resulted in positive change. Lifestyles were altered. Christian perspectives were awakened and given relief. There were miracles of healing, restoration, and problem-solving. New inspiration took hope, and it is our hope and belief that this church will never be the same after this special visitation from God. Hallelujah. The record, <coughs> the record of this seven-week revival shows 135 salvation experiences. For this, we give praise to God, and we thank Him for His amazing grace. There are other churches that have spiritual, special blessings of unusual nature. However, God's call to repentance has been taken seriously, and His people have humbled themselves before Him. His amazing grace 
has been evident in changed lives. He is not a God who would call people, then ignore their response to his call. The sacrifice of his only begotten son at Calvary expresses the seriousness of his love and concern for our needs. We cannot understand such love, but we surely thank him for it. This is why we call his love and grace amazing. It is amazing love. It is amazing grace. Hallelujah. This is not to suggest that his call to repentance has been fully satisfied. That is something which now may be put behind us while we move on to something else. The posture of a people humbling themselves before God is one that can never be abandoned by his church if we are to have divine favor. There must be a continued searching of hearts and opening of ourselves to divine illumination and conviction. And when we are convicted with broken spirits for having displeased our dear Lord, we must be ready to fall on our face before him, asking for forgiveness. Can you say amen? amen. <clears throat> then we cannot continue in this way for which we have been convicted. There must be a submission to walk in his way. Repentance, after all, means turning from and quitting what we are or doing that was wrong. Oh, that a gracious God we, oh, what a gracious God we have. One